Okay. Oh, it's live now. Okay. So you're live? <laughs> it's counting, yeah. Okay, you're about to go live. Get ready. When it's one, you go. You start talking. It's already live. Okay, then turn me off and you're on. Jesus. Hello, and welcome to Mrs. Spencer's Ooh. Math Lab. Call John. Call John. Tell him that I have something up here that says. It says, try another way of going live. Did you click it? John? No, you're on. Just keep talking. Keep you're, talking. You're live. <clears throat> you're live. Okay, thank you. It has something on the side that says try another way of giving, of uh, going live during your broadcast. No, no, you're good. Just keep talking. Tell me keep talking. You're live. I oh. can see you. And I can hear you. Okay. Hello, and welcome to Mrs. Spencer's Math Lab. I'm so happy that you tuned in. As a math tutor, my emphasis is to work with students, first of all, to show them that they can be successful. Secondly, to get rid of some of the concepts and ideas that they have about math. For example, math is hard. It's not really hard. It's just your approach to it and your practice because math is a skill and you have to practice a skill just as you do any other skills. Word problems are difficult. No, they're not. You just need to learn how to read math. And that's one of my focuses as well. My parents were not good in math. Well, they may not have been for various reasons, but that doesn't mean you can't be. I don't like math. Well, usually we don't like things that we don't do well in. So it's my, my, uh, focus is to get you to like math because we are like something we are successful in. So I want to make you successful. I'm doing well if I make a C. Well, a C is not really the best grade you can have. The C is the top of the bottom and the bottom of the top. I'm sure if you went to a physician and he told you he was a C physician or a C surgeon, you would walk right out of that office and would not want him to be your doctor. So my attitude is that every child can succeed at their level. Now I realize everyone is not going to exceed, uh, succeed at the same level. Now I know you parents have had a difficult time tutoring your own child. That's hard even when schools open because parents and usually end up with a crying session. And of course, that's the end of learning. So now you are the teachers. And certainly, I'm sure some of you are having a difficult time. So it's my, uh, my idea is to help you as parents and to help your child learn math and be successful. So those things I've said before, parents, please don't tell your child, I'm just not good at math. You may not have been. Various reasons, and I won't even name them, but some of them start with sometimes the person teaching math that was not a math major and cannot really understand what's wrong with what you're doing. So don't tell your child that 
that does not help them at all. Encourage them. Keep saying, you can do it. You can do it. Just keep trying. Have patience. Never say, I just told you that. No, instead say, well, let's see. Let's see what you're doing wrong. Don't compare your child with their siblings. That's the worst thing you can do. Or with anyone else. And don't use negatives that when you're dealing with them. And sometimes you may be frustrated because you don't understand it. But just you work a little harder too. And of course, please tell your child to always ask questions. The only question that, that I consider is improper is the one that you did not ask. Because asking a question tells your teacher, your tutor, your parent, what it is that you need help with. My, my focus in teaching and tutoring is on concepts. Because there are some concepts that are common threads that go all the way through math. And once we have that, we can apply that to everything in math that we're doing. An example is addition and subtraction. You can only add like things. For example, if I ask you right now, how much is three dogs and two cats? And take a moment, think about that. Three dogs plus two cats. Now I know some of you said five, but that's not a complete answer because I had some things I named. I said cats and dogs. So if you said three dogs and two cats, I might accept that answer, but that's not the best answer. The best answer would be five animals, five four-legged creatures. And what did you do? You made them both have the same denomination. Both are animals. Then we can add them. That goes right straight through math. When we're adding whole numbers, we have to put ones under ones, tens under tens, hundreds under hundreds, and so on. That's why the numbers have to be arranged properly. When we're adding decimals, we have to put the decimal points under each other so that the numbers will line up right. When we're doing fractions, we have to have the same denominators. We can't add three-fourths and three-eighths because the answer certainly isn't six elevens because the denominators have to be the same. And it goes right on straight through algebra. We can't add x plus x squared because the first thing your teacher would tell you in adding variables is that the variables are alike only when they have the same letter and the same exponent. So every time we get to addition and subtraction in math, that would be the first thing I would say to you. And then my second thing would be, when are these things alike? How do we make them alike? And so we go. So if you get the concept first, then you're able to go from there. It's important that you work with your children, even from kindergarten, Many parents are so happy to say, <clears throat> my child can count from 1 to 50. But if you told them to bring you five objects, five coins, they have no idea. <clears throat> so we sometimes get confused that's, and we think that they are counting when they're only memorizing. So we have to work with our children so that we be sure that they are on point. A successful student does study, and homework. And I want the students and the parents to know that those are two different things. Homework is what the teacher has assigned so that you can practice what you have learned. Sometimes she gives you a study assignment, but study is going over the principles 
and, and processes that you have been taught and practicing along with that. So be sure that your child does study as well as homework. Math skills must be practiced. Practice makes perfect. We'll never drive a car if all we do is read about it. We have to get in the vehicle and drive. Asking questions, again, I can't emphasize that enough. Never be afraid to ask questions. And learn to read math. That's why we said math problems are difficult. Because most of us do not know how to read math. We don't read it as if it's an English paragraph. Every time we get to a math word, mathematical word, or a number, then we need to process it. If you read that whole problem and don't process anything, when you get to the end and the, a question asks you to, to give an answer, you have no idea. So whenever you get to a math word or a number, Mary has two, stop on the two, books. John has five, stop on the five, books. Then the question is, how many books do they have all together? Well, you have already processed that one has two and one has five, and they're both books. So it's just a matter of adding five plus two. It's just as simple as that. In my classes and in my tutoring, I have students read with me. And we stop on the same words. If it says a rectangle, we stop and consider what is a rectangle. What are the properties of that rectangle? We don't just read the sentence. And if it says its length, we best have drawn that rectangle and length is the longer side, and we will go to that. Whatever you're reading mathematically, process it as you go. Don't just read the problem. And that's what makes word problems difficult. I've had students that I have taught how to do math problems on the phone once I teach them how to read it. So we need to know the language of math as well. And knowing the language is a little different from just defining a word. When I say know the math language, we need to know what it means, not just what it says. And this is what gets us off. We said the product, right away we know that's multiplication. The sum, that's addition. Opposites. One is negative two. The opposite of negative two is positive two. We have to process. Just a dictionary definition does not work in math. We have to process. We have to understand the definition. So when your child comes home and just can recite a definition, you need to say, what does that mean in your own words? Otherwise, they could have all the definitions, and that's the end of it. Stress relationships, how things are related. How, for example, when we first get to multiplication, we've already had addition. And really, multiplication and addition are really related because multiplication is just a shorter method of adding. So it's easy to add two plus two, that's four. But if I gave you a hundred twos to add, it would be easier for you to say a hundred times two is 200. So you should always make those relationships. If a child forgets what his tables, for example, what five times nine is, he can simply get that answer by adding five nines and he will come out with 45. It is good for your child to memorize, and schools do not 
work with that as much now, but you at home need to work with those tables, multiplication tables, because when your child gets to higher math, when your child gets to division, they definitely have to process that multiplication. So at home, that is something you can do. You can be certain that they understand that five times nine is the same as adding five nines. Same thing for division. Division and subtraction are related. If I want to take two from 50, I could just subtract two and get it. See how many twos? Count the number of twos I got out of 50. But the easiest way would be to divide two into 50 and learn that process. So again, relationships are very important because you, it, uh, sometimes relationships help you more than memorization in lots of situations. All this equals success for your child. All this equals understanding. All this takes away the confusion that they have about many concepts in math. Another thing I want to speak on is teaching processes. Memorizing the process is not enough. As you teach a process, you need to do the process. So just having them recite it isn't anything. Again, they may recite it, but have them recite it as they process it, as they do it. Division, for example, many students can tell me what the process is, but they can't do the process. So be certain that they can do the process. The equation, for example, and we have had students to come to me and they think that solving the equation is giving me the answer. But solving the equation is really doing the same operation on both sides of the equation to isolate the variable and find its equal. So if I have x plus 2 equals 5, Everybody knows that's 3. So if you just say x equals 3, you haven't solved the equation. So the question is, what do I do? And once we know, and I do not teach the process, I teach the concept that each step of an equation has to be equal. For example, if I hold out my arms and I put one hand up and the other hand down, that's not equal anymore because it's not the same. So sameness is very important. And equal is even more important. Both sides have to remain equal at all times. So then the only lesson that you have to teach is how do we determine when to add, when to subtract, when to multiply, when to divide. And that is where I come in and teach that. There are really some advantages to tutoring over teaching. <clears throat> because when I teach a student, it's one-on-one. -on -one. I'm observing that student as they work. And then at the same time, I can almost see their antennas go up. And I can see when the confusion comes up into the process. I can see when they stop on something and right away I tackle that because I'm, my, my success is that I have found what blocks you. I have cleared out the block and you don't even need me anymore. That's when I feel success. So that's one of the things that tutoring allows me to do. So I work and the student works. It's not my talking to them, we work together. I talk, they talk. They tell me what they have on that step and I say, okay, I understand what's wrong with that. Let's look at this and we go from there. So tutoring is a bit different from teaching in that 
I'm close up. We are one on one. And I can see, or even in small groups, I can see when you are confused. I can actually pick it up because I can watch your behaviors and I know when confusion is setting in. All right, so these are things that I had on my mind to share with you this evening. Hopefully you'll find some of the things I've already said profitable and something that you can think about and do with your child. If you can't be successful with it, that's why I'm here. That's why I'm here. So you can make an appointment and we're for an hour session, or it doesn't have to be an hour. An hour a week could be maybe half an hour, two days, however you need it. But we will work with an hour a week. But even if a child needs more than an hour, I usually don't do but an hour at a time because even adults' minds start wondering after an hour. So an hour. So when you're two, working with your child, give them rest periods in between because after an hour, they need a rest. They need a moment. They need a break. The mind just starts to wonder, even in adults. I hope that some of the things I have said have been helpful to you, and I'm here for you if you need me. Thank you. You may sign up online for tutoring. And you're, it's free for the first 15 students. The first week is free for the first 15 students. And the fee is $15 per, per week for an hour. But it's negotiable. I seldom turn anyone away. But 15 is... Did you, did you know how to end it? N no. Okay. George called say, me, so I'm not... I'm. Oh, no, go ahead. It should say at the 